All right, hello class. And welcome back to the final part of this lecture, part D, where we discuss what happens if your initial orbit does not coincide with the orbital plane you wished to launch into. Now, the biggest changes that we're going to discuss are inclination changes, because as we discussed in part C, these can often be limited by your launch sites. In particular, for the United States, we launch at Kennedy uh, quite often, and that limits our launch inclination to inclinations greater than the latitude of Kennedy. So even if you were have a perfect launch, you would still be stuck with a, uh, a launch uh, inclination of, I don't know, what is Kennedy? Go back and remember. Uh, Kennedy here, uh, right, has a latitude of 28 degrees. So you'll never do better than 28 degrees launching out of Kennedy. <clears throat> so occasionally, if we want to launch into, say, an equi uh, we want to, an equatorial orbit, for example, we have to make an inclination change of 28 degrees. So this is the simplest case, an uh, inclination only change, or a plane change only, so that our initial and our final velocity magnitudes don't change. Also, incidentally, the least efficient form of orbital maneuver because we are not changing the orbital energy of our orbit at all, but only the angular momentum vector, the direction of the angular momentum vector. So a zero correspondence to change in energy of the orbit and delta v needed to get there. Right. So in the simplest case, uh, actually the mathematics are quite simple as well, and so we don't have to worry too much about them. Uh, there's no change in magnitude of velocity, so in, uh, semi-major action is, is fixed. Um, <clears throat> the eccentricity, f, true anomaly, and omega are also fixed, so we're not going to, say, uh, 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 change our sort of magnitude, we're not going to do out of sort of orbit maneuvers. So we're going to only burn sort of along the direction. So we're not going to change that flight path angle at all from beginning to end. Okay. So for these inclination only changes, all right, the geometry we're looking at here, right? So we have some initial inclination and we have some desired final inclination here. Now, to have a pure inclination only change orbit, these delta V burns have to occur at the ascending or descending nodes. Uh, we can also have descending nodes here. <coughs> Otherwise, you will change your right ascension. Uh, yeah. So it may be acceptable to change your right ascension. If, in fact, you desire to change your right ascension, you could combine this with a right ascension change. However, uh, since right ascension is somewhat arbitrary, we assume that's fairly easy to limit with launch time, launch windows. So in inclination only change orbit, this is called a pure uh, orbital plane maneuver. So very simple geometry. So we want to change our direction only, right? not the magnitude. Now, Again, the geometry here is relatively simple. Here is your triangle. You've got velocity before, presumably equal to your velocity after. And so the triangle that you're looking at for velocities is you have initial velocity, final velocity. There's in two dimensions, this is your vector. And so we just draw, finish this triangle here by drawing your delta v, uh, the vector required to get from your initial velocity to your final velocity. So these are all vectors. Okay. And as indicated in this relatively simple triangle, right, we can figure out what that delta V is relatively easy by bisecting this triangle and then using the Pythagorean theorem or the uh, law here, actually we're just using uh, sine, right, definition of sine, because this angle now is theta divided by two and so we have uh, delta v over 2 here. And so we can just apply this sine rule, right? 
sine of a theta over two equals opposite over hypotenuse, delta V over two divided by V. And so we can uh, just multiply here by V and multiply by two and we get delta V equals two V sine theta over two. So the magnitude of our uh, delta V is simply equals to two times the initial velocity times sine of theta over two, where theta is our inclination change in this case, because it's a pure plane maneuver. Of course, this formula works for any pure plane maneuvers. Uh, if we assume that it's delta inclination, that's fine. If we were changing right ascension, we would occur at the uh, point 90 degrees uh, from our ascending node. So that would be if we were trying to change our right ascension. <clears throat> right. Um, so that's that's pretty that's pretty much it. The only other uh, question is uh, what direction do we do this delta v burn? What direction is this with respect to our current and flight path angle? So in particular, we're looking for uh, theta flight path angle. So which direction do we burn? Again, this is relatively easy to calculate. All we have to do is uh, draw another triangle here. So in this case, we're going to draw a perpendicular right there. That's a 90 degree angle. Extend this angle out a little bit. And now we've got, again, uh, from law of similar triangles, that this is theta over 2. And so that will also be theta over 2. And actually, in this case, then, we can just figure straight out without any calculation what our flight path burn direction is going to be. It's just going to be 90 degrees plus theta over 2. So. I didn't, I'm, I'm, theta flight path angle, that just means the burn direction with respect to your current flight path. So 90 degrees plus theta over 2. Easy peasy. <clears throat> Now, you do note here that this can be rather expensive, right? So in particular, if you're in low Earth orbit, for example, and your velocity is uh, that of a circular orbit, for example, uh, then velocity would be on the order of 8.6 kilometers per second. And so uh, for a substantial change in inclination, you can get really large delta Vs. For this reason, it's generally better to uh, <clears throat> either combine your flight path, your, your inclination change with another burn, or to, if you're going to a higher Earth orbit, uh, do it as far from the gravity well as possible, because all of this delta V is lost. There's no, it, there's no change in energy of the orbit associated with this. So pure plane change maneuvers, again, we try and avoid them as much as we possibly can. For that reason, <clears throat> or one of the reasons, um, we often are interested in combining uh, these, uh, I these inclination changes with other changes, such as changes in right ascension. So for example, if we want to change our right ascension by amount uh, initial versus final, uh, then we can do that uh, without doing two separate burns, right? So we don't want to do a, one burn for inclination change at the equator and then another burn for right ascension change at 90, at this arc 90 degrees, right? So if we did a pure inclination change, it would occur at the equator. And if we did a pure right ascension change, it would occur at u equals 90 degrees. But of course, that's not a good idea. Right. It's not a good idea because that's inefficient. So if we're going to combine plane change maneuvers, uh, there's a separate set of geometry that's at work in this case, and it gets a little bit more complicated. So again, we're going to focus initially on the case where velocity doesn't change. Right. So Vf equals Vi. We'll address that later. And we're only going to figure out what is the angle of our uh, change in direction, so this theta, from initial to final. <clears throat>
And of course, uh, if we actually wanted to combine it with another delta v, this would be vi and vf. But let's we'll leave that for a later slide. All right. Here we're just going to come focus on the geometry. So the geometry is a little bit complicated because, of course, now we're dealing with spherical triangles again. And in particular, here we come back and we have to use the law of sphere, the spherical law of cosines. And it's a little even worse than that because we're actually using the second spherical law of cosines. So, well, I don't know if that's any worse than the initial one. So there's two, co two laws of cosines for spherical triangles. And I'll just mention them here in a second. I'll just put that right there. Or maybe we'll put it over here and find some place convenient. And I'll copy down the second law of spherical triangles. So the sphere law, as with the law of triangle, uh, the law of cosines, um, what we're looking for here are uh, relationships between these three angles, right? Uh, so a angle and two sides versus the opposite side, angle side opposite. Uh, in our case, uh, we're actually going to use the second law of cosines, where we have uh, two angles, and we're interested in angle side. So you see, we, instead of having two sides, we have two opposite angles. And remember that this, this, like in spherical triangles, sides and internal angles really form similar uh, relationships, right? They're, they're all angles. They're, none of them are lengths, at least on the unit sphere, which we're, is what we're thinking about. So let's just cut and paste that law of cosines, spherical cosines, uh, to the clipboard here. And that's because, right, we have these internal angles more than we have the lengths of the side. And in fact, the only length of the side we have here is determined by our true anomaly. Actually, this we have this one as well. That's determined by our right ascension change. But this is inclination. This is also related to inclination. And this is our change in flight path angle, or our change in, in, in direction. So we copied that. So let's cut and paste it over to here. Here it goes. Our law of cosines. So now let's apply that to our spherical triangle here. And here we're not at 90 degrees anymore. Let's get rid of that stuff too. So we have two relationships, right? One of which, of course, we're trying to figure out what this angle is, what, what we want to, to get there, based on our knowledge of what our initial inclination is. So assume that's known, initial inclination. And we also assume we know the initial right ascension. Seems reasonable. Next, we have a desired um, right ascension and a desired inclination. We assume those are known as well. And so the only real ambiguity here is what is this angle here? This, what is the angle we rotate our velocity vector by? And there's another ambiguity, which is where in the orbit we perform this, because we don't really know where is the best place in the orbit to perform this, this delta V maneuver. Delta V. Right. So let's apply our laws of triangles, spherical triangles, spherical cosines, to this problem, where we're trying to figure out theta and we're trying to figure out u. So first, let's try and figure out theta. Right. So let's look at the problem. We have this internal angle, we have this length, and we have these two other internal angles where this is actually 180 minus I2. So we have two opposite angles and we have these two things right here. That's our first problem. So we're gonna apply the law of cosines to this, right? So in this case, we've got uh, A is going to be theta. Uh, the little a will be delta omega. And then these two internal angles, b and c, will be i and 180 minus i2. So this is going to be i1, i1, 
and 180 minus I2, 180 minus I2. Well, fortunately, uh, this cosine of uh, 180 minus I2, well, that's just equal to negative of cosine I2. And so we get rid of this pesky uh, negative sign there. Those two cancel out. And sine of 180 minus I2 is fortunately just sine of I2. Right. So we, uh, we plug all that in, and then we apply the law of cosines, and then we get this uh, relationship um, here, okay. which gives us, uh, I believe, uh, yes, yep. that gives you a relationship here. So if we multiply through by sine sine, we get, right, this is delta omega, and sine sine, uh, and then these become these. We move this over to the other side, and the negative signs cancel out, and we then just get on the on the right hand side left over cosine theta. So we can use this to either to, well to either solve solve for theta or to solve for delta omega, one of the two. The other one that we're interested in. So this is going to give us theta. The other angle that we're interested in, of course, is u. Notice that u doesn't appear here, so because of the ambiguity, we're going to solve for theta first, and then we'll apply the law of cosines to get uh, u1. So let's bring back the law of cosines, and so I don't have to erase everything again. I'll just make another copy. Now in this case, what do we have? Well, we've got this, we've got this, and we have a bunch of other angles here. We have i and theta, so those are the sort of opposites. So in this case, we're going to say that A is, in this case, U1. And this uh, internal angle is going to be um, uh, 180 minus I2. Uh, this is going to be I, and this is going to be theta, I and theta. So co again, cosine uh, minus I, uh, 180 minus I2 is just equal to negative cosine I2. Okay. So in this case, uh, we've got uh, cos negative cosine O2. We've swapped its location, so it's moved over here. Uh, cosine I, cosine theta, that's negative, so we moved it to the other side. We're going to move that to the other side. Uh, sine I1, I should write, write down the ones. And uh, sine sine, right? So the sine signs go to the other side as well. So then we uh, isolate. Uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. So there's uh, cosine I2 here on the other side. And uh, so cosine I2 is going to the other side, and we move both of these things to the other side. So that becomes plus cosine cosine and uh, minus sine sine, right? Because that fl sine flips when we move to the other side. Or we just, I guess, multiply the whole thing by negative one, and then we get the same thing. In any case, we have two relationships now. This first one yields our theta, and then this one yields u1, which tells us where in the orbit we're going to do our burn. Specifically, this is equal to the argument of periaps plus the true anomaly, where we do our burn. Okay. So I think that's just reflected here. Again, right, a repetition of what I just said. Uh, first, we have our desired angles. Uh, compute the required plane change using this one, and then compute the required true anomaly uh, using this one. So again, once we have that angle, once we have the angle theta, uh, the actual delta v that we need to use 
is uh, relatively easy to calculate because assuming that there's no change in magnitude of the velocity, right, the angle is, the triangle that we draw is, is identical, right? It's just, that's been replaced by theta, and we have V1, V2, which are presumably the same, and then the sign connecting them is delta V. And so the magnitude of our delta V is just the same as we had earlier, it's just theta over two. So again, right, uh, this can be a relatively large magnitude of delta V, and hence it would be best if we could do it quite far from the imaginary axis. Or, sorry, 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 far from the gravity well. In particular, this becomes much more efficient uh, for the same angle change when we have very small velocities. So if, for example, you have a bioliptic maneuver where you're moving way out into our our, infi our star, close to our infinity, uh, then do your plane change over there, and it's almost free, right? Again, there's no current energy difference between these two orbits, so if you can do them far out from the gravity well, it doesn't hurt you in any way. So it's generally speaking better to combine these things. That's one of the major reasons it's better to use a bioliptic, it's because you get almost a free plane change maneuver at that apogee of the transfer orbit. So now we'll just do a, uh, a quick uh, numerical example here. Uh, suppose we have an initial inclination of 55 degrees. We have an initial uh, right ascension of, let's, I think we were calling these one and one, initial right ascension of zero degrees. And we want to change them to an inclination of 40 degrees and a right ascension of 45 degrees. So there we go. Those are uh, two angles that we got there. Uh, we have information on the radius. Uh, so we'll need that when we're computing the magnitude of the delta V as well. So again, this is relatively easy to, to do. We just apply those formulas that we got on the previous slide. In fact, I'll just grab one. Um, mm -hmm. Based. There we go. Just for reference. First, uh, first step is to solve for theta, right? And um, it looks like we're using the uh, this formula right here. So this is uh, delta. Is uh, actually it looks like we're using yeah we're using this one. Uh, Forty-five degrees. Uh, this one is um, 40 degree, uh, 55 degrees, sorry, 40 degrees, right? Uh, we're clearing the uh, denominator, moving over to the other side and solving for theta here. So isolate theta, again, uh, 55, 40, and 45. We just solve for theta, cosine theta, it's 0.8117. Uh, we do a inverse cosine and we get a flight change, a delta theta of 35.74 degrees. Uh, so that gives us theta. And this is a calligraphic version of theta from the picture. And now we want, just want to calculate uh, where in the orbit we're going to make this maneuver. So we're going to calculate u there. So we're looking for u in this case. And here we apply the second formula we have here, uh, where we're solving for u, uh, dividing by, again, uh, i2, uh, no, wait, sorry, this is um, 35, um, 55, 55, 35, and uh, this is our unknown, and this is uh, 40. So again, we solve this for um, u, cosine u, and we get this expression. We calculate it and we get the cosine of u is point, negative 0.628. Then we do a inverse cosine and we get that uh, the angle corresponding to that uh, in our orbit is 128 degrees. So actually quite far along in the orbit. Uh, remember that's true anomaly plus uh, argument to periapse. 
If we assume that the argument to periaps is zero, then the point in the orbit where we do the burn is at 130 degrees. Right. So again, we have our two angles, one and, uh, and two. And now we're ready to calculate uh, the magnitude of our delta V burn. So again, uh, it's just that simple formula where this is 35 degrees. I think it was something like that. Uh, now we've got to calculate our V. Uh, so that's where we were in a circular orbit. We use that A, I think it was 1.8 Earth radii, something like that. We plug that into the uh, formula here, mu is one uh, for velocity. And we get that the velocity at the plane change maneuver is 0.78745 Earth radii per time unit. We plug that into our formula here for delta V, and we get the magnitude of our delta V is 0.457 Earth radii per time unit. So again, a, a relatively large uh, delta V on the order of four kilometers per second. So relatively large. For the reasons that uh, I mentioned earlier, right, because it's all wasted energy, we often try and combine plane changes with other delta V maneuvers because they just become more efficient. If you do a delta V maneuver and then do a plane change, it's less efficient. If, you, if you're going to do a delta V maneuver, any kind of delta V maneuver anyway, it's much more efficient to do your plane change at that point because the delta V magnitudes are much larger. Uh, so for example, or smaller. So if we have an initial velocity, right, and we want to boost it to V plus, um, to V2, which is, let's say, V1 plus delta V, uh, let's say, hat, right? And we also want to do a plane change maneuver, right? Then doing that delta V, right, this delta V here is going to be fairly close to the uh, ideal delta V of just a delta V maneuver by itself. So when you, if you combine that plane change maneuver with a delta V maneuver, it's a much more efficient use of delta V. However, it does complicate the uh, calculation somewhat because you now don't have a right triangle anymore. Uh, your triangle has gotten a little bit difficult. So in this case, uh, we're gonna, we can just apply the law of cosines not the spherical one, just the normal live cosines, uh, to get our resulting delta Vs. So, and you'll see that they're presumably a little bit lower. So let's uh, just find our initial, del initial velocity and our target velocity. So we'll call that V1 or V minus uh, plus uh, some magnitude of delta V. Let's call it hat. And uh, we want to determine then um, the, we have a fixed plane change maneuver and we want to determine the magnitude of the velocity change and we also want to determine what angle that's going to make with our current flight path angle. So two questions. It turns out that finding this one, the magnitude, is a little bit easier than finding this one because there's quadrant ambiguity in this one. Okay. So for, to find the magnitude of this, right, it's a relatively easy problem because obviously you have, right, it's, uh, it's an, a length opposite an angle, and you have the two sides, and so you can just apply the law of cosines, right? So this delta V, that's like C, A squared, B squared, A, 2AB, and then the angle between them, which is theta. Right? App, straightforward application of law of cosines. And then we just take the square root of this to find the magnitude of the delta V, so that's pretty easy. So yeah, easy, easy does it. Now the flight path angle direction is a little bit more complicated. Now we have, of course, more information. We've got the delta V as well. And so the question is, what is this flight path angle? Well, it's not in the triangle, so let's flip it over to the triangle, 180 minus theta, uh, FPA. And so now we, well, what are we gonna use? I have here that we're going to use the law of sines. Um, I'm not sure that that's a great idea, but, uh, sorry, actually, I'm drawing this wrong as plus. Uh, but uh, if you do it, right, you can do it. You can also use the law of cosines to get this. Um, 
because now you've got delta v and v minus. So I would actually suggest you use a lot of cosines when finding these because you have all these pieces of information and there's less quadrant ambiguity for the law of cosines. Any case, uh, I'm using the law of sines, so oh well. Um, so here we've got sine angle over length, so v plus over angle, and then I've got this angle over uh, underneath uh, delta v. So I've got all of these numbers there, and there's delta theta. And so I just solve this for flight path angle. I do an inverse sine, uh, get uh, my 180 comes out, and I get that my flight path angle with respect to this line is uh, given by this formula here. Although again, right, suggest you use law of cosines. And the reason is, of course, because um, because we applied the law of cosines, there is quadrant ambiguity. In particular, right, uh, these two angles are equivalent, right? So this angle over that one, and this one over that one, right? So those give you the same law of, of sines, but obviously this angle is, is quite different than that one. Uh, so you've got to do a check, a sanity check, um, based on your answer here to determine if you're actually finding this angle or you're finding this one. So just be careful about that. Again, I think uh, if you use the law of cosines, uh, that should um, resolve this question because there's no ambiguity in that angle. So uh, do not think so. So again, probably not the best one to use, use the law of cosines, which would, of course, in this case, be uh, v plus squared equals v minus squared plus delta v squared minus 2 delta v v minus uh, cosine uh, 180 minus flight path angle. So actually, that, that's probably a better equation to use in this case. So either one, though. Uh, quite honestly, uh, you know, it, when students end up using the law of sines, I, 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 I mention all this because when students end up using the law of sines, they, all, they often make these quadrant ambiguity errors, and so it's better to use the law of cosines. Um, again, right, here's just a figure I, I pulled out, right, here's your delta V ideal, right, if you're doing combining with a plane change maneuver, uh, delta V ideal, and just comparing with the case where you're not doing a plane change maneuver, you're just doing delta V and then a plane change maneuver, which is much less efficient. And here's again that, uh, that, a, that magnitude formula right there. Uh, okay, so well, that's uh, that's pretty much it for out of plane maneuvers. Uh, we don't because we are just changing the plane of the of the of the maneuver. We don't really have to have a transfer ellipse. Although, if you're already doing a transfer ellipse, uh, you should investigate various ways to make more efficient plane change maneuvers. Uh, but in some ways, the plane change maneuvers are a little bit simpler. But of course, make sure you draw your triangles correctly. Initial velocity, final velocity, delta v, always, and flight path angle. Okay. And plane change angle. All right, just keep that triangle in mind and you should be golden. Uh, other than that, I guess we have reached the end of lecture nine. In lecture 10, we'll come back and discuss the more complicated question of targeting, how to get from point A to point B in space in a fixed time, delta T, R1, R2. And we'll see this solves many a transfer orbit problem at the expense of possibly higher required delta Vs relative to, say, bioleptics and Hohmann transfers. So I'll see you then.